right, well, good morning, everybody. You guys can go ahead and take your seats. Um, glad to, to see you all today. We, we started a, uh, my name is Christian. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here at Expectation Church, so um, it's, it's good to meet you. Um, if I'm meeting you for the first time. If not, well, it's good to see you again. Uh, we are, uh, we're, we're continuing a series that we started uh, three weeks ago now uh, on money. Yay, money. And so that's, you know, it's one of those things we talk about it every week where there's always that, that and it, you know, it's without fail, there's always that one skeptic in the room that thinks that all churches care about is money and all that they want is money and look at this big, nice building, all this place cares about is money, 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 money. And then you come to church and you sit down and I say, all right, we're going to talk about money. And now I feel sorry. But sorry, not sorry. Because here's the, the, the reality is that Scripture, uh, there, there are great principles to apply to money and great principles to apply to our finances, absolutely. But Scripture also um, teaches directly to money. It's not just applying principles. There's actual uh, lessons and instruction regarding wealth, regarding money in, in the Bible. Jesus, we, we spent the last two weeks talking about what Jesus said specifically about money and our attitude towards money. Um, the first week we were in Luke chapter 16 and we were talking about stewardship. And one of the things that I mentioned is that you're going to see from week to week each of these, these passages that we walk through, there's a, a, they are linked together. It's almost like there's a consistent thread, um, consistent teaching about money in, in Scripture. And so in Luke 16 we, we talked about the idea of stewardship. And one of the things that, that Luke says uh, recording the words of Jesus is that you cannot serve two masters. Uh, you'll, you'll love one and hate the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money, wealth. The, the Greek word is mammon, which just means money or wealth. You can't s serve both. Um, you can only serve one. And so we talked about the idea of stewardship, uh, recognizing the fact that everything is actually not ours. God has just entrusted to us, the, the mammon, the wealth that we have, and we need to not view it as though we own it. We should view it as though he owns it because he does, and now it's our job to steward it well, to manage it well. And then last week we went to Matthew 6, where Matthew also records the words of Christ, and Matthew says that you can't serve both God and money. And Matthew, in Matthew 6, one of the, the, the big overarching umbrella lesson was about priorities. When it comes to our money, we need to change our priorities and be kingdom-minded rather than earthly minded, storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven rather than on earth. And so today, the umbrella term that I want to grab a hold of is, is godliness. And I'm going to be in, uh, I'm not in, in Matthew or Luke. We're not going to be uh, in, the, in the words of Jesus anymore. Now we're going to go to uh, some instruction that Paul gave to Timothy. Um, and there's a, there's, you'll see that link Again, about this, the, the, the linking verse here is this whole idea of storing up for yourselves. And so we're going to be, we're going to be talking about it. And today, I, I thought about, I, 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 it was a combination of running out of time and I just couldn't pull the trigger to do it because there are some really interesting uh, graphics that I could put out there, but I didn't, I didn't want to like really turn the screws on us that hard. So, but, may, but I'm still going to say some things, so it'll be fun. Um, so today we're going to be in, in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, and let me set the stage a little bit before we get there. So uh, Timothy was Paul's kind of, look, I'm a nerd, and I'm sorry, not sorry, so I'm just going to use nerd terms. There was a few weeks ago I said Super Saiyan, and some people were like, oh, I know what he's talking about. Other people were like, what? It's a nerd thing. Don't worry about it. Um, so Timothy was, was Paul's Padawan learner. And that's a, see, there's my nerds right there. That's a, a Star Wars reference. Paul was the Jedi master and Timothy was this, this, his disciple. He was teaching him how to, how to be a pastor, how to be a, a shepherd of people. And so Timothy was the pastor at the church in Ephesus. And while he's there helping the people, Paul wrote him a couple of letters, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and probably more than that, but wrote these letters saying, all right, here are the things. This is, this is what you need to be teaching. This is what you need to be looking for. This, so it was, a, it was a very much, you know, Jedi master to Jedi apprentice kind of letter. And so he writes this letter saying, all right, Timothy, here's what you need to be looking for. And one of the things that was happening in Ephesus to Timothy is there were uh, people coming in that were, you know, trying to lead the church in a different direction. They were false teachers. They were teaching heresies. They were teaching lies. And that's because the church was this new thing. 
So people were being opportunistic. They thought they could come in and, and, and convince people to not uh, go after this way, but to go a different way. And so these, these false teachers came in. One of the things that they started doing was really making themselves look righteous and holy and good. And they would try to come in and, and let me tell you, let me teach you some, some really deep truths. But in order to understand these things, you need to pay me. You need to, I need to be paid. I need, I, I need to, to grow financially. So what they were doing is they were uh, using this whole idea of godliness for financial gain. The purpose of their faith and practice, the purpose of their teaching was to get paid, was to get money. And so um, Paul is, is helping Timothy recognize this and call this out. And so while he's talking about the, the specific references to these false teachers, there's still some, some general principles or some general uh, uh, truths that come out of this that are directly about money. So this whole idea of godliness, let me, let me explain godliness really quickly. I, when I was studying and I was looking into the, you know, the, the scriptures on this, this idea of godliness, I actually, I love it. I think it's a really cool term. Um, godliness, how do you explain godliness? Because every time, every time I see godliness, I kind of get stuck on it a little bit. Because, well, godliness is to be godly, so how in the world can I be like God? Like he's God, I am definitely not so how can I be godly? Well, the way to explain godliness is you, you take your faith, the faith that you confess, the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here and you don't have faith in Jesus Christ. Um, it's really, really simple. Jesus Christ came into this world uh, uh, divine and human at the same time. And well, how does that work? I don't know because he's God and I'm not. And we already established that. Uh, Jesus came into this world and he lived a perfect life and then he died on the cross. He did all of that so that any wrong thing that I have done, the, the penalty for that, the judgment for that, the wrath for that would be satisfied on the cross. That's what Jesus did for me and for you. And so that, that, that he gives us, there's this free gift that your sins can be uh, atoned for your sins can be forgiven and you can in return you can also be given the the righteousness the holiness the goodness of Jesus Christ it's a free gift of grace and the avenue the channel through which we accept that free gift of grace is faith it's faith it's a profession of faith believing that Jesus died on the cross believing that God raised him from the dead and accepting him by faith as the Lord and Savior of my life that's that's receiving that's reception of the free gift of grace. And so when we have professed that faith, when we've received grace, what it's supposed to do is bear fruit in us. Like a, a seed that's been planted, it grows. This is why Jesus talks about the parable of the sower or someone that scattered seed and something grew. It, it, it grows and it's supposed to grow and grow to the point of fruitfulness. It's supposed to, we're supposed to be changed from the inside out by our faith in Christ. Godliness is that, that place between what God has done in me when I came to faith in Christ and the outworking, how that, that faith is gonna manifest itself in the actions and the, and the fruit that I bear and the life that I live. It's, it's living out that faith that has happened internally. So godliness is the outworking of the internal faith. That's what godliness is. And so these guys came into town and they were trying to put on a show of being godly as though they had faith, but they were doing it for financial gain. And so Paul calls this out. And so I'm going to skip around a little bit because I'm really honing in on the financial passages that Paul uh, is using whenever he's teaching Timothy. But I encourage everybody, I'm not trying to hide anything from you. Go read all of 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then when you're done with that, go read all of 1 Timothy chapter 5, and then chapter 4, and then 3, and then 2, and then read all of 1 Timothy. It's really, really good. So let's jump in verse 6. But godliness... He just got done talking in verse five. He says, these guys are using godliness for gain, for financial gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Now I need to set some of this stuff up here. So contentment. In Greek thought, and Greek philosophy, this whole idea of contentment, what it means to be content, it was kind of considered an ideal of life. And what it meant was to be entirely and completely self-sufficient. You don't need the support or the charity or the aid of anybody. 
You are entirely self-sufficient. We might use the term today financially independent. But that's what contentment meant. So what Paul is doing is he's shifting and he's changing. He's giving it a new perspective here. He says, it's not just contentment. That's not the ideal. It's godliness with contentment. It's when we have faith in Jesus Christ and that faith bears fruit in our action. It's how we, how we live out our faith. It's, how we, it's the outward expression of our internal faith as, we, as godliness happens with it. And we pair that godliness, which is because it's rooted in, and based on faith, it's dependent upon God. Then we come to this place where we, are, we find all of our sufficiency in him. So it's not a self-sufficiency, it's a God-sufficiency. So that we can look at just the, the food that we get and the clothes that we have and just be content with that. We're fine with that. We're content with that. All right, we'll keep reading in verse nine. Those who want to get rich. Now let's just pause right there. Those who want to get rich. Now aren't you glad that I didn't start this message with a question, do you want to get rich? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of hands would have gone up. There's songs about it. I want to be a billionaire. Uh, money. There it is. It's what I want. So wait, but money is this thing. Do you want to get rich? Because if you want to get rich, the Bible has something for you. Those who want to get rich. All right. Tell me how I'm ready. I got my notes out. And some of you are like, I got my notes out. How? Tell. All right, those who want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Some translations say with many pains. Some translations say with many sorrows. Those who want to get rich, this is what happens. Nothing good. Oh, well, dang. <laughs> All right, so looking at the kind of these, these two different slides that we just went through, verses 6 through 10, I, I just want to take just real quick, um, first thing that I want us to understand when it, when it comes to finances. And this is actually going to be the link to next week's message. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now he's not talking about financial gain. Because he said we can, we'll be content with just food to eat and clothes on our back. I mean that's not very much in, a, in, a, in the worldly scheme of things. I'll be content with that. But godliness with contentment. That's great gain. He's not talking about financial gain. He's talking about real, authentic, true gain. That what really matters. He's talking about spiritual gain. And you notice, it, it, it's because I, I had to cut some stuff out, but in verse five he says these people are using godliness for gain. Godliness for gain. But here he says godliness with contentment is great gain. He goes beyond just gain. It's great gain. And so what he's saying here is that if we want to be in that, in that place, in that place where we find real, authentic Lasting contentment, it happens with godliness. Godliness with contentment. Now that's what really matters. That's great gain. But then on the other side, so this is very positive, And that's, that should be encouraging and it should be comforting. But on the other side of it, he also has a, a, a warning to those who want to get rich. So to those who want to get rich, there's this, this list of things that he, he says. The first one is they fall into temptation, what that word fall into, what, what fall means is to, to land, to end up where you don't want to be. I was my, I don't know if, the, but there's, if you notice or not, there's some snow and ice outside right now. And um, I, this week I told my son, we were, because kids had like winter break 2.0 this week. It was awesome. Uh, I think they went to school for a day and a half. And um, the, so one of the mornings we get up and, uh, my wife goes out and she shovels the, the driveway and the, the sidewalk and the, the front step. And some of you are like, well, what were you doing? I saw my, my, my wife doing that. Well, you know what? I'm gonna, I, need to, I need to do something for her. And so I got up and I made this. I started making this breakfast. I made Belgian waffles and scrambled eggs and smoothies and bacon. I thought she'll come in out of the cold. It'll be a nice hot breakfast. 
I'm not the fastest cook in the world, so we ended up having breakfast at about 11.30 that day. And everybody started th- saying thank you for, for brunch. Um, so we, w- while we were sitting around at our, at our brunch, uh, we were talking about shoveling snow. And I told my kids, I said, if you guys get out there, just go up to someone's house and say, hey, I'll shovel your driveway and your, your, your sidewalk and your front walk. I'll, I'll shovel it for 10 bucks. People will pay you. And so they, they worked out this little scheme where they went outside and my, my youngest was spreading salt after they shoveled and my middle daughter, she was going out and knocking on doors because my son didn't really want to do that, but my son was the one doing the, the bulk of the work and they did that for a little while and then they came back and they did one house, got 15 bucks and my son came back and said, I don't think we did a good enough job. So I said, all right, son, I'll go out there with you. So we go out and I, 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 I did not do the work, he did the work. And I said, all right, well, I just kind of showed him some things. And so he did all the work. And then the next one, uh, uh, we were, we were kind of on the way back to the house. And I said, son, why don't you go knock on their door? And he's like, really? I said, yeah, just do it. And he knocks on the door and says, I'll do your, your driveway for 10 bucks. And they said, $10, really? And he goes, yeah. So then my son spent the next hour doing their house and they paid him 40 bucks. And while he was out there shoveling, this lady comes out her front door. Hey, hey, can you come to my house? And Jace goes, Sure, $10. Great, please come. And so then he went over and did that house. And while he's doing that house, the lady like pokes her head out of the second story window. And she goes, hey, boy, can you come do my house? And my son, he goes, yeah, how much? <laughs> I said, son, you need to tell her $10. He goes, is $10 okay? And she goes, yes, I'll pay you more. And then he goes, how much more? And I'm like, No. Those who want to get rich. So anyway, he went over and he did their house. My son, he he ended up doing four houses, walking away with 70 bucks that day. Good job, boy. That's good. I'm probably, we can clap for him, right? So I'm out there and, uh, you know, I, 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 my wife did all the work. My son's done all the work and I need to do something. So I go out and like, my wife needs to take the truck. And I said, all right, sweetheart, I'll go, I'll go clean the truck off for you. And I'm out there, you know, brushing it down and scraping the ice. And I walk around the front of the truck. And when I get around the front of the truck, apparently there was ice under the snow. And if you were in my neighborhood watching me, you would have gotten a really good show at that point. Because I totally 100% ate it. Like full on feet up in the air, me looking down at the ground, coming to me thinking, dang it, bam. Well, that was fun. And I get up and finish cleaning off the truck and whatever. But I, 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 I fell really hard and it hurt. Those who want to get rich, those who want to be rich, they fall into a place where they don't want to be. And it's a place of temptation where you're constantly going to be lured. You're constantly being drawn away from where you want to be. Those who want to be rich, they fall into temptation. And as they're being lured, what happens is they become trapped. They become ensnared. So they're ensnared, the scripture says, by foolish and harmful desires. So the word that I kind of came up with to, to combine these ideas is unhealthy. It's not good for you. You get trapped in these desires when you want to be rich. It's, it's, it's a snare. It's a cage. It's like a a bear trap that is closed around your ankle. That's what these desires bring into your life. They are not, they, these desires produce nothing good for you. Only that which is bad for you. It's foolish. It's senseless and it's harmful. So those who want to be rich, they fall into temptation, which causes them to be ensnared by unhealthy desires. And then that leads to them being Plunged, plunged into destruction. Now, Paul says ruin and destruction. He uses two synonyms to bring the point home, to make it that much stronger. And what that word plunged means, it's like a, a, a ship that is sinking at sea. It means to go completely into it, to be completely under. So you're plunged into destruction, into ruin. In fact, the, the word destruction is so strong that some scholars think Paul is talking about hell. Plunged. A ship that's lost at sea, completely sunk into destruction. This is what the desire to be rich brings about. And it ends with, after all of this, as if though that weren't enough, Paul talks about being pierced, or another word that describes what Paul means by pierced is impaled. I like that word because it's very strong. Impaled with many pains. 
What are those pains? It, well, it could be your, your desire to, to be rich could lead to all of these things which could result into damaged reputation. Do you know anybody that's lost their reputation and their relationship? It could be damaged relationship with others because they cared more about money. It could be uh, uh, all kinds of, of different pains. You could lose everything in your pursuit of money. Everything that's good in your life, impaled with many pains. So this is written to those who want to be rich. Aren't you glad I didn't start with that question? But Paul's not done. After verse 10, Paul gives some instructions specifically to Timothy, and then he starts telling Timothy some more about finances and how to teach people. So I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to go to verse 17 now. And he says, command those who are rich. Now let's pause there. Command those who are rich. Command those who are rich. So some of you hear those words, you're like, okay, well, I know this applies to some of these people in this room, but it doesn't apply to me. Oftentimes what we do, is, and I spent some time researching this, I looked at the, you know, the, 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 and I'm sure there's some financial geniuses in here, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but the Credit Suisse, um, they, pronounce, they produce a, a world wealth report every year or every couple of years, and I looked at the last one that came out, and they have this, this wealth pyramid. If you want to know if you have this much net worth, so right now I think it's a, a, up to $10,000 worth of net worth, then you're better than, than you have, then you're in like the, the bottom 50% of the world's population. So what is net worth? Net worth is your, you know, the value of your cars, the value of the, the equity that you have in your home, and you, you take everything that you have, the cash on hand, your savings, all of it, everything's in the positive, and you compare it to everything that's worked against you, your credit card debt and all your debt, your mortgage, whatever, and then you, you, you combine the two, and that's your, your net worth. So if it's Less than $10,000, and you know, you're in the, the bottom half of the world. But if it's more than $10,000, if it's between $10,000 and $100,000, then you're doing better than half the world in your net worth. If it's more than $100,000, you're doing better than like 80%, 85%. If it's more than a million, you're, you're like, you, you're, you're a top, you're, you're a one percenter. Everybody talks about you. Anybody remember the Occupy Wall Street days? That was some fun conversations around the dinner table. You're a one percenter. Also found some other, did some other research, did some other looking into it. A Starbucks barista, a Starbucks barista in the United States, their income puts them in the top 10% of the world. Starbucks barista in the United States, their income, their income puts them in the top 10% of the world. So, I mean, it only gets worse after that. And if you're pulling down the median household income in Fairfax County, you're a one percenter or close to it. So when we talk about command those who are rich, oftentimes what we do is we hear those words and what we do is we look at the next strata above us and we say, that's what rich is and I'm not there, so I'm not rich. Or the next two stratas above us and we say, oh, those, those are the rich people. Elon Musk, he's rich. Jeff Bezos, he's rich. Oprah Winfrey, she's rich. That's what rich looks like. I'm not rich. All right, now let's look at the standard that Paul talks about when he's writing to Timothy and he's talking about contentment. He says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. So if your basic needs are met, if you have food and clothing, anything beyond that, I think we could start to define as rich. No, yes, there are varying levels of rich. And we live in a time in the, in the age of the world where wealth is, it's just ludicrous, insane. It's so crazy. Wealth is so nuts in our world today. I remember learning about the space race of the 60s and 70s during the Cold War. First, we were, we were in a, like world powers were in a race. It was predominantly just the, the USSR and the United States were in a race. First one of the moon wins. So they were sending up satellites and, and, and spaceships and rockets and all this stuff. It was a space race. Now, people are so rich, they're in a space race amongst themselves. Literally. That is nuts to me. You've got uh, uh, Richard, so I'll just name three of them real quickly. Richard Branson and Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos. These guys have so much money, they can do what nations were doing 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. That's crazy. There is so much money. So we look at those guys and we say, that's what rich is. Let's actually, instead of looking to the higher strata, maybe we should understand the strata that we're in now and understand that that if we have food and clothing, if we are beyond our basic needs, 
we are rich. We are rich. So now when Paul says command those who are rich, instead of us glossing over and saying, oh, this doesn't apply to me, maybe it actually does. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Now, verse 19, we'll finish off. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. This is our link back to Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So Paul tells Timothy, he's actually giving him instruction, teach people who have money, teach people who have wealth, teach people who are rich, teach them to live this way because this is how they can store up treasures for themselves. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So there's instruction here. Those who are rich. So Paul has really talked about two different people groups whenever we, we get into these finances. Those who want to be rich and the warnings that are there and then those who are rich. Now, is it possible that that? You could be one or the other or neither. Sure, we can go, but I'm pretty sure if I asked everybody, which camp do you fall into? And some people say, well, I don't really want to be rich. I just want a little bit more. I, I, don't, I don't have to be Jeff Bezos with Amazon and the Washington Post and all that. So I don't have to be that. I just, you know, would like to be a little bit more. I want to get to that next strata. I don't have to be rich. And I just, you can say that. It sounds an awful lot like those who want to be rich. Instead, understand where you actually are. Those who want to be rich. And there's really beautiful instruction here about finances. The first one is don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Don't think that because you have wealth and that you are in a, a, a better place, that you're better than anybody else, that you're better. Sure, you may have more finances. You may be better off than somebody else, but that doesn't make you better than somebody else. I've kind of run into this issue with my children a little bit because one of the things I teach my kids, and you can say this is a bad thing, well, they're not yours, they're mine, so leave me alone. One of the things I teach my kids is I tell them we are rich. You guys need to understand that we're rich. You need to understand that we're doing better than, like there are people, we, our church on Vision Night, we're gonna have a, a missionary to the Philippines is gonna be joining us, a guy named Greg Lyons. I mean, he can talk about what, what third world poverty actually looks like. There's people that live in boxes that would, that, the, the, the food that you throw away is probably more food they'll see in a week. So we, we are rich, and I tell that to my kids. Now, this has kind of backfired on me a little bit because one of the things my youngest daughter has said before, I'm trying to coach her out of this, so she'll go up to people and say, are you rich? And everybody, of course, says no. She goes, well, we are. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> Don't be arrogant. I'm not saying my little daughter is arrogant, but it's an arrogant thing. It's, it's her innocence and her, her childhood mind, I think, is so applicable to what so many of us fall into. We think the money that we have gives us a certain status, makes us better than. And Paul is teaching, look, if you have wealth, don't be arrogant. Don't be haughty. Don't be, do we, uh, in this place where you think you're, you're better than. Don't be arrogant. The other thing he says is don't put your hope in money. Don't put your hope in money. He says because it's so uncertain. Money is uncertain. Does anybody remember 2007? When everybody had money and then all of a sudden everybody started having less and less and less. And I remember we bought a house. It was awesome. We watched the market go crazy high. And then the market started to turn and go down a little bit. And so we thought, oh, this is a great time to buy. And we bought a house. It was over there in Centerville. It was a townhouse. We bought that thing and 
had linoleum floors and Formica countertops. My dad is a contractor, so we, we bought that and we started remodeling and started really dressing the place up. And then we were like, yeah, we're, we're really putting money into our resale value, our resale value. What's happening to our resale value? And it, it wasn't, it started, it, there's just a slow decline. And all of a sudden, like between 2000, 2008, it just, the slow decline turned and it became a rock that was dropping. And I remember, it, it, it sucked. And during this time, our family was called by God to leave Northern Virginia and move to Florida. So we did. We moved to Florida and we started renting a house. So at the same time that we were renting a house down in Florida, we were still paying our mortgage back in Virginia and we put our house up on the market. We thought if we can just get a little bit of money out of this, that'll be good. Nope, didn't happen. So we thought, well, you know what, we could just put, if we could just break even, that'll be good. If we could get out what we paid for it, that'll be good. Nope didn't happen. So then we thought, you know what, if we could just, I think a great idea, if, if we could just, you know, lose all of our equity and so that way we can go to the closing table and just not have to pay anything, but not get anything, just literally have zero, we'll take that. We just kept lowering the price on our house, lowering the price on our house. Our house did not sell for six months. And the whole time we're down in Florida playing, paying our mortgage and paying rent and we're just watching our savings disappear. Thank you. It was awesome. So, so we're losing all of our money. We can't sell the house. And then finally, finally, after, and look, we had literally, we had like 300 people come to our house and look at it. No offers. We talked to so many different realtors. We tried selling it ourselves to try to save money that way. We, we tried everything. And finally, a wonderful, amazing lady in the church said, I will sell your house for commission free. Let me get to work. And I said, okay, great, get to work. And every time, every week, we were calling her on the phone and she was saying, I don't know what's happening. This is crazy. Your house just won't sell. The house next two doors down, that sold for asking price, not yours. Finally, finally, we got an offer. And the offer was, okay, you can get out of your house but you gotta come to the table with lots of money. You have to pay even more money to get out of your house. What? How does this happen? We didn't even have the money. So I've said this before, I'll say it again. I did what any self-respecting millennial would do. I picked up the phone and I called my mommy and daddy. I said, we need to get out of this house. Can you help us, please? And them being children of the greatest generation, <laughs> yeah, we have, we have money, we'll help you out. And they, they, we got out of the house. Where did all the money go? We had a house. Houses are the safest investment you can get. That's what everybody says. We improved the house. We lost our savings. We lost more than our savings. The money just vanished. Don't put your hope in money, which is so uncertain. It can just vanish. I know because I lived through it. It could just vanish. Don't put your hope in money. And oftentimes what we do is we look at our future, we look at our retirement and our inheritance and all these things. And look, it's good to be good stewards and to save and to do all of that, absolutely. But don't think that's where your hope lies because that can disappear really quickly. Don't put your hope in money. Instead, put your hope in God as your provider. And I love what Paul says is God who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Look, I'm not saying that everybody needs to go out and take a vow of poverty. It's not what I'm saying at all. But we can actually, God gives us, and what God gives us, we can enjoy. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God gives you. But don't put your hope in material things. Don't put your hope in money and wealth. Put your hope in God. If God blesses you, great. You're allowed to enjoy it. That's fine but put your hope in him who richly provides. But as God blesses you, this brings me to my next one that Paul teaches for those who have wealth, for those who are rich. As God blesses us, be rich, not in our material possessions, not in our money, not in our mammon, not in our wealth. Be rich in good deeds. Remember that idea of godliness? It's the outworking of our faith. Be rich in the outworking of our faith. And if you have money, I believe that you have greater accountability, greater responsibility, a greater calling to be generous with what you have. To be rich in good deeds. That's why Paul says this is what it means to be rich in good deeds. The first thing he says is be generous. Be generous with what you have. The next thing he says is be ready or willing to share. And I love that he uses that word share because it comes from the same Greek word that we get the word for fellowship 
for. So what he's saying is people who have wealth, they should be willing to share their wealth and they should be willing to share themselves, their hearts, fellowship. It's very easy for people who have wealth to write a check. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I wish it was easy for me. It is easy for you. Sometimes that, that, that beautiful, adorable little child comes to your house, knocks on your door and says, hey, we're selling candy bars for $5, which is a total ripoff and the candy bars aren't that good anyway. So instead of like getting to know that child, oftentimes what we'll do is say, all right, here's $5, please leave me now. It's easier, I'm not saying it has to be a big check, but oftentimes it's easier just to give a little bit of money than to actually get invested. If we wanna be rich in good deeds, what Paul is teaching is that yes, we need to be generous. If we have wealth, if we have money, we are responsible for being generous with that money. At the same time, we are responsible to share what we have and to share who we are with others. And then, and then, I love how Paul closes this out, and I'll, I'll close with this as I, as I invite the band to come back out on stage. He says, you do all of this, and there's a, there's, in, the, in the Greek, the word is hina, or ina, it's uh, I-N-A, H-I-N-A, and what it, what it means is so that. In the Greek, we call them hina clauses. It's, it's a so that clause, it's a purpose clause. It tells you the reason, it tells you the purpose for all of this. Command those who are rich, to not be arrogant, to not put their hope in wealth, but instead to put their hope in God who richly provides for us. Yeah, enjoy the provision of God who richly provides with us with everything for our enjoyment. But command them to be rich in good deeds. Command them to, to be generous and ready to share, ready and willing. How can I help? How can I share with others, both myself and my, my money? Command them these things so that. Why? so that you can take hold of life that is truly life. The thing about chasing after money is, here's the truth of it, you're, if you're always wanting to get rich, you're gonna get to another sphere and you're gonna find it just as empty as the last sphere you were at. And you're gonna wanna get to the next one and the next one. And you'll never be satisfied. You'll always be wondering, isn't there more to life? Anybody ever been in that place before? Isn't there more to life? Is this all life is? And what Paul is teaching here is, look, when you, when you live out godliness, godliness with contentment is great gain. When you, if you have wealth, if you're, if you're ready and willing to share and you're generous and you're putting your hope in God rather than your wealth, when you live this way, you take hold of that which is truly life. Truly life. I think what Paul is talking about is the exact same thing that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10. I have come that they may have life and life abundant. When I talk about eternal life, eternal life isn't something that we're only gonna experience in eternity. Eternal life isn't something that we're only gonna experience in heaven. Eternal life is something that we can take hold of now. This is what Paul tells Timothy in verse 12. He's telling him again in verse 19. We can take hold of that eternal life now. Live truly now don't be consumed by the passions of wealth because all that's going to do is plunge you into destruction impale you with many pains and sorrows and griefs instead if you're a person of wealth if you're a person of wealth and I, I hit this point again I, I think I'll, a lot of us are probably better off than we think we are if you're a person of wealth be generous be ready to share and I love what Paul says in Romans 12, that whole idea of sharing ourselves with each other, that whole idea of sharing with others, it's not just limited to the people of wealth. It's for all people in the church. But if we have wealth, we have a greater responsibility and calling from God to live in godliness, living out our faith with great contentment so that we can live truly now.